why did the why did the universe have the Big Bang to express itself in all the possible combinatorial, you know, kind of combinations of like you know, this size star with one planet at this distance. Okay, mm -hmm. same size star with two planets. Right, it plays out all the possible combinations, and there's probably even multiple Big Bangs that are playing out lots of other different variables of physics and yes. and quantum realities and whatnot. And perhaps, one saying I was once heard, all this is just consciousness trying to understand itself by playing out all the possible scenarios, all the edge cases. It's sort of like you could say white light is split in this prism just to map out all its component pieces. And so perhaps the reason it goes to that prism to get sharded out in all these different configurations is to dance with uncertainty. Yes. You know, uh, to create a little bit of like action and uncertainty and mystery. You know, we have platforms coming out of Silicon Valley that is directly affecting the behaviors, the perception of every human being on the planet. With that comes a level of responsibility that I think sometimes we shirk here. We've also been innovating nonstop on this, you know, kind of manifest destiny thing of just make it faster, cheaper, better, free returns, less shipping, take out all the friction for the sake of more convenience, more choice, more instant gratification, more speed, more scale. The hidden price of convenience is you lose connection with the thing you made convenient. I love that you brought up the food example. When meat is a McNugget, do you know where it came from? Do you even know if it's a chicken? Like, <laughs> you have no idea and you don't care because it's been so abstracted from the source because we're now in the era where it's about AI and proprietary data, those and the, the, the talent that work on AI as the new oil and gold. Those are the new scarce resources. Those are the new battlegrounds of, su of supremacy. You could see a dystopian future where three or four mega, mega corporations run everything. Um, interestingly, you have a bizarro parallel universe in China where they have their big three or four. If we could charge ahead with tech with the wisdom of you know historic humanity as well, I think that'd be a nice compliment. And, and you know how we started the podcast was basically refine the questions keep questioning the system yes. and try to explore and build new models for the future. I kind of think a lot about perhaps we weave this cognition of death more and more into our everyday and knowing how to die well perhaps gives clues of how to live well. That's a really good doorway to this wow. And a lot of it really starts with self-love, you know? That's the doorway to capacity for infinite love for everybody. What if God is that capacity within us to have that same intensity and depth of compassion, empathy, and love for all beings, for, for all nature, for everything else around us, you know? That vast, infinite sort of sea of, of, of all-encompassing love. Yes, yes. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are on site in Menlo Park, California at Mayfield. We are now going to be talking about WOW and why that's greater than why. We have Tim Chang joining us on the show. Hi, Tim. Hi, good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on the program. Thank you. We're so honored. We're very grateful, very pumped for yeah. our conversation. Yeah. For those who don't know Tim's background, he's a partner at Mayfield Fund, investing in next-gen commerce and marketplaces, communities, health and wellness, and digital media. Has been twice named to the Forbes, Forbes Midas list and the always on power players of top investors, as well as receiving the Special Achievement Award from the Gamification Summit for his work in leveraging game design thinking. Tim has led early stage investments, creating more than $2.6 billion in total exit value, sits on the board of Myriad Companies, is a bass guitarist in two bands, and aims to bring a wow to each moment. <laughs> And you can find his links in the bio below to his Mayfield page, as well as Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check those out, everyone. Tim, we have been so fascinated with understanding the nature of this reality. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> Honestly, with each passing day, I think I have more questions than answers. And I think that's okay. I, I've come to the conclusion, I think, um, the, the process of refining the questions maybe is the answer. This process perhaps is um, the real point of this whole journey, right? And uh, I don't know, it, it's funny because 
as I, as I keep learning, I, I just keep going back to these aphorisms and sayings that have been around with us for a long time and seem really trite and almost fortune cookie-like, but they're just so right. Basic ones like know thyself mm -hmm. or as above, so below. Yes. Or another way I've heard it said is as within is expressed without. You know, all these things. Um, another one I heard um, with a group that I've been working on, there's, we've been thinking about this value of small is all, meaning what you do in each moment is reflective of then how you express yourself in all the other moments. So it's sort yeah. of like the micro leads to the macro. I see it expressed in what I do here at work because what I'm realizing is that startups, companies, institutions we build, they're really just extensions, amplifications of the intention, the energy, the values of the founding people, right? And in that way, culture never really happens by accident. I mean, it can be emergent, like if you don't define what you want your culture to be, it will emerge and will likely be a reflection of um, the values, the energy, the intention or lack thereof of the people behind it, right? And so um, it, it, it's all a very fractal pattern that these seeds that come from within in terms of what our intention, what our our, our, our alignment is our energy, if you will, not to sound too woo about it, but just kind of has those ripple effects that ripple outward in these concentric shells, these fractal patterns that keep magnifying at different, uh, that different layers of magnification, orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. We're constantly refining the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're in this process. Is the purpose of this being made for us to go through the symphonic artistic process. Ah, I love that uh, that phrase you used. Okay, so um, in a deep, deep meditation um, I once did, this image came to me and it, it really kind of spelled out a lot for me in terms of this framework. Imagine just beautiful, glorious, all-encompassing white light and it is made of all the different hues and colors. And if you were to split it out in a, in a prism, you would separate out all the possible combinations, all the, the permutations, the different hues and saturations and, and whatnot. And each of them is as unique and brilliant as the others, just as valid. Um, but the assembly of all of them, you know, the complete codex of all these colors makes up white light. And so one could argue that, let's say, why did the, why did the universe have the Big Bang to express itself in all the possible combinatorial you know, kind of combinations of like, you know, this size star with one planet at this distance. Okay, mm -hmm. same size star with two planets, right? It plays out all the possible combinations. And there's probably even multiple Big Bangs that are playing out lots of other different variables of physics and, yes. and quantum realities and whatnot. And perhaps, this one saying I was once heard, all this is just consciousness trying to understand itself by playing out all the possible <laughs> scenarios, all the edge cases. It's sort of like you could say white light is split into this prism just to map out all its component pieces. Maybe in a similar way consciousness represents itself in all the Allens and Tims out there because there's a certain Allenness only you can express, right? And um, you know, it's playing all of these possible scenarios out to map out that possibility space. Wonderful short story by Jorge Luis Borges that uh, is called The Library of Babel that um, also explains this in a different format. Picture an infinite repeating library of these uh, hexagonal chambers, right? Made up of identical bookshelves, identical layouts, and uh, in it, identical sized books just for eternity. And there's one book out there, and all it says is A, 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 and there's another book next to it that says A, 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 B, onwards, 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 until Z, 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 and then contained with that library is every possible story in every possible, you know, language in that alphabet. And and so that's another way of framing the same thing. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Those are such good ways of putting it. So consciousness, adventuring out to understand itself, to be at play in these symphonies through yeah. this art can be viewed yeah. through this source white light breaking up through a prism with all the hues and saturations. It can be viewed as this library of just starting with just the A's all the way to just the Z's and all the different combinatorics can be viewed in the multiverses that are unfolding. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and within that is all the range of possibilities in that one universe. And then the funny thing is you could have a library of Babel that has different size shelves and books and that would be a whole different universe in itself. So you'd have a universe of universes or the so-called multiverse, right? And I, I like that you bring up the word play because I think that's ultimately what this is all about. Yeah. It's, a, it's a giant dance because yeah. um, I remember, you know, some occasions tapping into that source consciousness, that white light, just for a little fleeting moment and realizing how grand and, and, and wonderful and, and all-encompassing it was, but then also kind of cluing into, hey, this could be kind of boring too, because when you're everything and all possibilities at once, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. You're everything. It's 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 all infinity contained. And so perhaps the reason it goes to that prism to get sharded out in all these different configurations is to dance with uncertainty. Yes. You know, the, to create a little bit of like action and uncertainty and mystery. Um, yes. There's another great quote I once heard, which is what the departed like to tell the living is that the thing they miss the most outside of ice cream is um, the delicious mystery of uncertainty. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, this is the stuff that drives humans nuts. We don't know. Our brains hate uncertainty because they are survival program machines to try to figure and predict things out, have causal narrative, all, you know, clearly cut A versus B, black versus white, zero versus one. We try to minimize uncertainty as a survival instinct, but really, you know, uncertainty is, you could argue, the spice, the joy, the point of life. You don't know what's gonna arise. Yeah, yeah. so to go through all of these combinatorics to be at play with the uncertainty unfolding throughout all of them. Yeah. Also, another good one that we liked mm -hmm. is that this is where you can feel the illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, have you read that short story, The Egg, by Andy Weir? Yeah. You know, author Hopefully of the Martian. we'll have him on the program soon. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm such a fan of that story. Because yeah. that's another yeah. wonderful sort of short metaphor for this same kind of framework we're talking about. Yes, you know? yes. Yeah. Would you say that the all that we're discussing right now, these feelings of oneness and play, uh, interconnectedness, love, would you say that our disconnection from that is the most upstream issue that we face? Yeah, I, I, I think so, this illusion of separation. Um, you know, at the core of it, what I keep wondering is, what does any human really, really want? Yes, they want, you know, lack of suffering and the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but the root, root thing people want is to be seen and witnessed and acknowledged and that sense of connection and community, right? I think what it is is going against that sense of separation, right? It's, it's like returning to that communal feeling. These are things church used to provide, and now, you know, the modern church doesn't have that same context, but we are trying to synthesize alternatives, whether it's Burning Man or Raves or Cuddle Puddles or whatever it is, things that bring us back to that sense of connection, you know, those fleeting moments where it's like, wow, I, I am you, you are me. We are, we're all sort of connected. We're different reflections of each other, you know. One of my favorite exercises to do that, too, is... Um, you know, next time you're at a dinner party or a small gathering, when you go around for self-introductions, instead of, you know, who you are and what you do and that sort of thing, uh, Keith Frazzi once taught me this, but go around and say, okay, your name, and what is the single biggest thing that you are wrestling or struggling with in life right now? And what's interesting is by the third or fourth person, people are just spilling their guts. They're getting really raw and authentic and vulnerable. And what that taught me is vulnerability is the ultimate bonding superpower. And by the time you go around the table, what's kind of marvelous is you realize, holy cow, we're all wrestling with the same five or six things just in different formats and framings. And that, in a way, feels very, I don't know, there's a strong sense of relief there because you're like, oh, I'm not alone in the struggle. We all dance with the same challenges. Yeah. Wow. Vulnerability and feelings of community uh, bonding around these very similar challenges that we face. I really like that activity a lot. And it does seem as though we are very much so gravitating uh, our energies towards these examples that you listed um, of ways to, whether cuddle puddles or burning mans or uh, even just trying to redesign cities and communities around um, um, men's circles, women's circles, right. yeah, these right. types of things. 
And so that's, is that then um, the architectures, the designs that we hope to um, put into the social fabric of the future? Yes, uh, I love that we're going there. Okay, so now we can intersect where, where this is all heading in terms of future of work, future of play, future of cities, future of families, all these different systems and institutions we've had until now and are getting rapidly disrupted with new technologies, you know, kind of new ways of being, more reconnection with self and each other. We have long blamed technology for, you know, this sort of disconnection with ourselves. We're living, looking at our screens and that sort of thing. I like to say, though, technology is not an enemy. It's just a tool. And so, like with all tools, you know, it's um, a hammer is not bad. It's the intention you do with it. You want a hammer to build a birdhouse, you want a hammer to go whack someone in the head. It is all about the energy and the intention you bring to it. So tech is not the enemy per se. It's our mindless or mindful application of it, which is the difference. And so, uh, one thing I have noticed that the evolution, the history of technology, if we peel back and zoom out, you know, Silicon Valley, historically, when it first started, was building a lot of widgets, literally semiconductors and parts and pieces that would go into other technologies. So it was often tech companies selling to other tech companies. Fairly limited in scope of people it reached on a direct basis. Then, branched more into things like enterprise software and applications. And so Silicon Valley, we had startups selling um, tools, product services to other businesses. So you're reaching workers, employees, whatnot. Then we had, you know, uh, through the late 80s and 90s, technologies that was touching every consumer. Now we have platforms coming out of Silicon Valley that is directly affecting the behaviors, the perception of every human being on the planet. With that comes a level of responsibility that I think sometimes we shirk here. In the Valley, we love to say, like, I'm a platform. I don't know the content on it. Frankly, I think that's a cop-out. Yes, I know why. It's because when you're at that scale, you can't manage the headache of sort of like moderating a discussion. But when as a tech platform, you do become the mass media, you do become the retail store shelf, you do become the arbiter of truth, then you have to step up with that responsibility out there. You can't just say, no, I don't know what goes through my pipes. I'm just a pipe, right? And so um, that's something I think we need to step up for here. We've also been innovating nonstop on this, you know, kind of manifest destiny thing of just make it faster, cheaper, better, free returns, less shipping, take out all the friction for the sake of more convenience, more choice, more instant gratification, more speed, more scale. The problem with that is we have costs with that we hadn't thought about with that, other externalities that we've created with that. Something I worry about now is that the, the, the price, the hidden price of convenience is you lose connection with the thing you made convenient. This is a very profound point. Yeah. And so, like, we don't uh, know where the food actually comes yeah, from. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. a big one. That's the right. Convenience is making it so that we don't care so much about the source. Right. And about the supply chain. There you go. Yeah. Um, exactly. And with that, then, once you lose connection with that source, you could lead to a lot of like mindless consumption. You could lead to what I think, frankly, is like zombie like behavior where you're just addicted to these dopamine drips of hits, of notifications, of, you know, retail therapy gratification, instant get this on demand, right? And um, I love that you brought up the food example. When meat is a McNugget, do you know where it came from? Do you even know if it's a chicken? Like, <laughs> you have no idea, and you don't care because it's been so abstracted from the source that I there's click a button and the yeah. drone delivers it to me. Right, and even with the on-demand economy, you click a button, a car shows up. Sometimes that can be dehumanizing to the workers too, right? We've built all these pr products and and services for these top one percenters living in uh, urban centers like San Francisco and New York, and the point is almost minimize human connection. Hit a button, leave the package there, go away, don't bother me. You know, it's almost like factoring out human connection. And so if technology 1.0 is all about this drive towards more convenience, less friction, it's created this abundance reality we have, which I think is making us very unhappy because now we have more content than you consume in a lifetime, more games than any one person could ever play, more calories than anyone could rightfully or healthily consume in a day. You know, all this stuff that is available to us now this abundance of choices, which actually creates a lot of stress because our brains still have the neural programming of when we were running around the steppes of Africa and, and, and just trying to survive in a threat-filled scarcity environment. That's why our tongues seek calorie-dense foods. Our eyes are looking for novelty. Our minds are always looking for simple heuristic causal narratives. We're looking for anything that gives us an edge for procreation. That almost explains any human's behavior in any one moment. Does this help me procreate? Yeah. Don't get eaten, eat 
and pass on my genes, right? And so we've got that scarcity mindset, but now it's living in this like huge abundance filled, you know, choice cornucopia. And the two don't mesh. That impedance mismatch is driving us literally crazy. We're literally battling our biology and our neural programming to, to get through each day. Hence, we need things like fasting and we need tech Shabbats and we need, you know, anti-tech addiction and we, have, we need more mindfulness because we're basically trying to curb our impulses in this sort of candy store of infinite choices, right? I feel like modern people, it's like you're, it, it's like you're, you're a crack addict and you've been handed a crack pipe with infinite supply and say, okay, self-regulate, right? <laughs> so maybe Tech 2.0 is about helping us manage those impulses and become better people, the people we want to be, you know, starting with more connection with ourselves and each other, but also maybe limiting some of these impulses, maybe reducing choice, maybe mm -hmm. reducing the need for so much willpower, maybe even, you know, reducing friction and convenience. You know, people think I'm nuts when I say that, mm. but I wonder if the next act of technology is introducing more helpful friction, more intentional, you know, mm. inconvenience to make us more reconnected with ourselves, with supply chain, with each other, with mother nature, with where things come from, you know? Because, you know, isn't that that saying you really care about what you have to work for, right? And, um, I was talking to Tom Chi the other day, you know, at, uh, he came from Google X, and he had this really great point that we're living in an age where everything is so well curated, you know, events and settings and whatnot, and it's all made for Instagram ability, mm -hmm. right? So it looks all great, but combine that with convenience is all about, it looks great and I didn't have to do anything for it. But I worry that that creates this sugar-coated surface that it had, doesn't have meaning, you know? So I, I, sometimes I go to events or, or festivals and everything's so well curated and I didn't have to lift a finger and it's all about like, ah, I got myself here, ch -ch -ch, right? And I forget I've even been there after a month as opposed to when you really have to work at something, when you have to sink blood, sweat, and tears into it, that investment creates this emotional true connection with it, creates meaning, creates purpose. And so I'm wondering if that's what we've siphoned out of a lot of our experiences is that investment, that work that we have to put into something to derive that meaning and purpose, which flies in the face of instant gratification and convenience. Very well synthesized. So what, you're, what I'm basically saying is like at my next birthday party, it'll probably have engineered adversity and challenge in there to make people like really raw and bond through shared adversity and struggle and, and vulnerability. <laughs> I, I love this <laughs> way of explaining modernity, having so much frictionless, instant gratification, dopamine drips, Instagram abilities, where there's not so much of the indigeneity aspects of blood, sweat, and tears of actually building the building that you live in, or gr planting the food and then and then fostering it and then mm -hmm. enabling it to produce you the food that you eat um, that these ways of, of viewing uh, a redesign of our social fabric that that focuses more on the connection to each other to mother earth um, that that seems to be a part of it I, I hear that and also just yesterday talking with mm. Kevin, Kev, Kevin Kelly on the program, this whole idea of a technium, this whole idea of where everything's heading in several hundred or even a thousand years, um, we were discussing about, well, will there, e will there be, uh, with all given all yeah. the combinatorics and permutations of technologies and artificial intelligences and all of this mm -hmm. other type of stuff that can self-replicate, May, it may be that certain people never look at other people in the eyes or that they never plant a seed and grow it and eat the apple from the tree. Yeah. So does it feel like those two things harmonize, both the reconnecting but also the mm -hmm. further technium? This is something I think about a lot. I almost feel like it's this interesting parallel race condition between these two uh, sort of forces. Um, and what I always kind of come back to is it feels like 
there's one set of forces that drives towards convergence, centralization. There's another set of forces that drives towards divergence, de decentralization. And the trick might be finding the harmony and interplay between both. But in, in many ways, I feel like these extremities are pushing even more outwards, more vehemently, right? Um, maybe we can riff on this for a bit, but I think about, is the nature of AI about the ultimate form of centralization? Um, I hope not, because that could put the ultimate gatekeepers in, in you know, power, right? Uh, as it stands, we've got, you know, these three or four mega platforms that are centralizing all the proprietary data, owning all the information, controlling all the forms of business and commerce out there right now, um, because we're now in the era where it's about AI and proprietary data, those and the, the, the talent that work on AI, as the new oil and gold. Those are the new scarce resources. Those are the new battlegrounds of, su of supremacy, right? And so when you have Google, Facebook, Amazon controlling fa uh, wide swaths of all these businesses, uh, you could see a dystopian future where three or four mega, mega corporations run everything. Um, interestingly, you have a bizarro parallel universe in China where they have their big three or four, exactly. right? So they're playing out 1984. We're playing out Brave New World out here, right? Uh, kind of different directions. Um, at the same time, this reconnection with nature, I feel like is more about self-sufficiency and decentralization. Um, just a small example, it's not, not a perfect example, but. The one upside of all these wildfires in, in Marin is one, all, you know, rich, privileged people finally got a taste of climate change, so we're like, oh, this is real. <laughs> but um, what it's really made people think of is, oh my gosh, I might have to take matters in my own hands instead of just relying on the convenient centralized grid of PG&E. Maybe I should get solar. Maybe I should be self-reliant for my energy needs. What else should I be self-reliant in case I can't count on the central grid as climate collapse starts to kick in, right? Maybe what that creates is more mindfulness and more hands-on action to like we talked about, not just rely on the outsourced convenience of like some other centralized platform, but to be more self-reliant. I should probably get solar. I should probably get a power wall. I should probably be able to be, you know, net neutral on energy production consumption. Huh, what if I did the same for water? What if I did the same for food, right? So it could be this decentralization back to sort of self-sufficiency, which would entail more mindfulness of where your energy, your water, your utilities come from, where your food comes from. Maybe heightens interest in being sort of self-producing on those uh, on those aspects as well. Because, you know, in the era of DoorDash and Uber Eats and all these other things, we've abstracted and outsourced it all. And so maybe the pendulum swings the other way and it's time to reconnect with all those things we've made convenient, right? Wow, to me, it also feels like with what you're talking about regarding centralization of artificial intelligences and mega corporations and decentralization of self-sufficiencies, those also feel like the yin and yang of, of modernity and indigeneity. And yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that's a, that is, that's a good way to, to look at that lens. Um, I'm really interested in studying indigenous wisdom again because I just feel like there's this notion of going backwards to the future. There's so much mm. wisdom that, you know, kind of traditional peoples got right, that uh, especially connection with nature, I think, and yeah. with each other. There's rites of passage, there's rituals, there's cultural context that we've lost sight of that I think we're hungering to bring back in. Right? And that applies for lots of areas, whether it's community building, spirituality, you know, how we use plant medicines, all those sorts of things. You know, we're charging ahead with tech, but we got to make sure not to dehumanize it. If we could charge ahead with tech with the wisdom of, you know, historic humanity as well, I think that would be a nice compliment. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, char charge ahead with um, the Wu Wei with this uh, Dao uh, while um, also remembering and integrating some of the 99.9% uh, .9 of, of our human existence pre-enlightenment, pre-industrial revolution that actually has some of the most important um, codes. Um, so uh, that's been a way that we've, that's been a lens that we've been looking at this with that we think is potentially one of the biggest keys for um, a prosperous uh, future. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about this 
um, you've talked about this before. Yeah. I really, I really like this um, idea of of once you um, hear the message, hang up the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, so once you do f- have these feelings of of oneness, um, we kind of run to sometimes. We, we run to the next peak experience. We, we see that <laughs> phenomenon happening. We also see people that <clears throat> ask the question, well, Tim, if you and Alan are so one already, why even have this podcast? Why even share it with the world? Why? Yeah. So how do, you, how do you balance this idea of effortless action, or mm-hmm. this, in, this desire to be a part of the Tao? Yeah. Um, effortless uh, yeah, in 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 action, you don't take action. Effortless yep. in yep. action, yep. and balance that with architecting a prosperous social fabric. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to share a bit about my own personal story. Is you know, sort of a lot of these explorations began for me, self inquiry, whatnot, probably a good ten years ago, and kind of ramped up from there. And um, you know, a couple of years ago, I definitely had a peak experience, sort of. I'll call it scratching on the doorway of enlightenment for just a fraction of a second. And within that, kind of, for me, saw how, whoa, this is the matrix, right? This is a little more than a simulation. Um, And it was beautiful, tapping into source consciousness, but afterwards, a little bit terrifying. And what I mean by that is, um, upon so-called awakening, a lot of times what we don't realize is that there can be a nihilistic downward slope of that as well because you could also say well hey if this is all a simulation why the heck do anything at all if it doesn't mean anything if there's no point then why do anything there was a moment I considered like let's go full monastic go sit on top of the mountain and just you know meditate 24 hours a day because everything else is just monkey games chasing pointless things to reproduce and pass on genes and I, I do wonder maybe that's why some mystics or or legendary you know enlightened folks didn't bother having families or children they did go full monastic and just go disappear to the mountaintops right that's one way to play the game you sort of say oh it's a video game done playing out of here mm-hmm. um, you know the other one is maybe it's then coming back down the mountain to just be of service mm-hmm. you know not to be a preacher or be a guru or prescribe anything, but just to maybe be a living example, that so-called be the change you want to see in the world, exactly. right? Um, to your point, though, on peak experience chasing, one thing I worry about a lot with um, you know current times is that with psychedelic culture, with all these other things uh, around you know consciousness hacking and whatnot, there are a lot, a lot of people that are seeking those peak experiences, and I get it. It's a kind of high, or it could be a form of spiritual bypass. You know, I know of people who are going off for their you know, 28th ayahuasca sitting within three months. And, you know, it, it sort of makes me wonder, when are you taking the time to integrate those lessons? Right. You know, you're on the phone all the time. You're getting the downloads. But when are you going to hang up the phone and start living those values, mm-hmm. right? Um, I get it. You know, you get these peak experiences and you get the call, so to speak, to jump into that world. Or maybe you yourself want to go be a guru and, and help change the world. But um, in moments that... I wrestled with that. I always caught myself that, wow, there's a lot of ego speaking there. And the biggest smack in my face was like, actually, Tim, you don't have to do anything or tell anybody anything or sell or preach or evangelize anything. Just try to be it, be it, right? With your smallest micro, remember those fractal moments as within, as you express without, every footstep, every heartbeat, every thought, every moment, every word said is an opportunity to just be that. And so, hence, serve as kind of just a living invitation for that, right? Um, And eventually, somebody may come up to you and say, hey, Alan, something's different about you. What's going on? And it's a chance for you to share your story. And if it, you know, opens Pandora's box, great, you know? And then maybe you leave some breadcrumb trails with some well-curated questions as opposed (laughs) to advice. And (laughs) and that helps somebody go down their own rabbit hole, right? And so that's that's kind of the thing I'm I'm thinking a lot about is um, how to just kind of come back down that mountain and not just sort of chase the spiritual bypass path, bypass path or go full monastic, so to speak, and find ways, um, you know, to be of service. But again, without necessarily prescribed agenda. Mm-hmm. A lot of us also battle with I want to save the world syndrome. And uh, my good friend Naval Ravikant once uh, said to me, he's like, you know what, all the strife in the world today, it's not super villains or evil people, you know, doing bad things. No one ever thinks of themselves that way. It's basically white knights clashing with each other on who can save the world the best, right? And so, 
road to hell paved with, with good intentions, mm -hmm. right? It's everybody has their good intentions or saying, my journey should be your journey. Yeah. As opposed to, you know what? This is what happened to me. Your mileage may vary. You know, I'll share my story. Hopefully it helps, right? All of us have our unique communions with that one. Yeah. yeah. So back to the white light and the color analogy. Imagine like purple number 32 trying to explain to red 18, you need to be purple number 32. This is how it works for me. So this is how it's best to be for you. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, we've got similar hues of some, so, you know, red and, and, and blue in there, but your path is, is totally as legit as mine, but wildly different. I'll have no idea what your path was like, but man, it's cool, yes, you know? Yes. So. Respecting the full inner unique journey of the snowflake or of that artist or of that instrument being played in the symphony in its full uniqueness of that full hue or saturation of the um, rainbow. Um, that uh, that being a main a main part of this, I also I also <laughs> I also I also really really appreciate how you're uh, you're able to both have a uh, a strong understanding of this these analogies and metaphors for the oneness and the uniqueness and the perfection, but also see that there's a, a uh, calling for one that immerses themselves in that feeling of oneness to not s just, in a sense, uh, go to the mountain, um, but immerse themselves in a sense in, um, in, the, in their state of being not with the mountain, but being in the civilization where they themselves create a butterfly effect around them with their family, their friends, their community, yeah. and then catalyze further um, inner artists to be unleashed in the Grand Symphony. Thank you for that, that reflection. That's a great way to, to phrase it and frame it, I think. It's sort of dancing with, can you do yes and? Can, like, I came from the hardcore rationalist side, started to dance with the mystical, but is there something that can blend both of them? Because there's wisdoms from both, right? Um, so, so with that journey, you know, for a year after sort of that awakening moment, I had the hardest time because I was losing motivation. <clears throat> I'd be sitting in meetings and I'd be almost laughing to myself. I was like, you guys, you're screaming about each other at these like monkey brain game sort of things. It, to me, it was akin to watching like a 10 year old spaz out at the video game screen and start chucking things around. And part of me was like, this is all a video game. Why are you getting so upset, right? Why are you hyper optimizing these things, right? Um, and uh, it was tough because I was like, oh my gosh, what if I have no mission left? This is that so-called dark night of the soul period, right? When you're questioning everything and don't have that North Star compass. And it took me a while to just float and sit with it until I realized, ah, okay, just because nothing quote unquote means anything doesn't mean you can't have some fun with it. You can't play with it. You can't do some good with it. And so really what I've come down to now is like, okay, fine. If it's all the matrix and there's no point, then maybe point is, this is all about art. It's about expression, and, and it's about perhaps service and, and helping each other. So that's where I came out to it. And it sounds super trite, but it's like, what's the point? Love. <laughs> that's it, right? So love of, of self and finding your voice, the, the form of play, love in the form of self-healing, the trauma and wounds you had, then love in the form of taking that superpower of yours that makes you feel most alive, most vibrant, sharing it with the world, but love in the form of sharing that play in service to more than just you, yeah. right? And that, I think, could be a really beautiful life. So it's sort of like, all right, fine, that's all a video game, but I'm no longer just chasing points and badges and achievements and level ups. I think I'll just play for the fun of it and, have, have, and, and maybe help others play, right? And that makes much more sense to me. <clears throat> that's impacted how I've even invested here at Mayfield because Alan, I realized I have a lot of karmic debt to repay because a lot of my initial success came in the worlds of places like gaming, social media, ad tech, other things um, that I don't know were net-net good for humanity or for mental well-being or, or spiritual health or those sorts of things, right? You mentioned I had that gamification award. I grew up playing, programming, you know, computer games and uh, really studying them inside and out and then leveraging those design principles. Frankly, a lot of times to try to hack engagement, you know, I, I remember sitting around in board meetings I'm not proud of saying this now, but we'd sit around talking about how to, you know, kind of addict users, right? 
And so I uh, now have a new filter, which is I won't look at any startups that aren't net net good for humanity. And that blocks a lot of things out. And uh, I'm looking at you, TikTok. But, you know, I told my partners, I don't care if TikTok makes $100 billion. I think it's one of the most deadly things on, on the planet right now for humanity. Algorithmically generated content to maximize engagement for addiction to drive more ads, right? In real time responsiveness. That's one of the, the potentially deadly forms of how AI can be leveraged. If AI is turned around to addict its creator, um, you know, with, with real time emergent media and just create this infinite echo chamber, right? Driven by a business model that's primarily just for driving more advertising. We have to look at the systems and the business models we use for these businesses. Um, I don't think the people at TikTok are evil. I think we just optimize for the business models that we're driving for. It's time to upgrade our playbook of what business models we use. They can't just be more about, oh, more engagement, more sessions, more ads. That's one I won't do anymore. So free and ad-based, I just won't look at. And the second model would be just produce more, consume more. This is sort of the classical mentality of buy by the pallet. And yeah, most of it ends up in your garage and not used, but you saved 20%, you know? So that's sort of like endless growth-oriented, you know, consumptive capitalist model. So I'll, it's made me really think a lot about the underlying systems and models we use and why it's time for a firmware upgrade for many of these things. And it seems like a main principle of that firmware upgrade is a style of immediate return hunter-gatherer that was symbiotic with its environment and symbiotic with one another, uh, which is in its sense, it's, it's, it feels like a big yin to the yang that is the the... TikTok feed that you were just describing. Yeah. Yeah. Or the perch by the pallet <laughs> and have it uselessly sit in the garage. That was our sort of up into the right infinite growth model for the last few decades of capitalism. The problem is we've reached, I think, an end state of that where we get a lot of unintended externalities and side effects of it. I mean, think about it. In nature, what grows infinitely forever? Only cancer till it kills the host organism. I'd argue humanity is now the cancer on planet Earth growing out of control mindlessly. I think, actually, that's why we had a fascination with zombie movies and TV shows that was basically a metaphor for ourselves on this endless consumption path. The walking dead is us, right? And so I think uh, we're looking more towards uh, maybe a better model for that. And I feel really grateful that Actually, some of our biggest hits at Mayfield have been more on that regenerative model about reuse, resharing, recycling, reselling. Um, you know, companies like Lyft, uh, companies like Poshmark, which is about reselling, trading, buy, sell, trade your existing fashion as opposed to just go buy more new stuff. Uh, and, and I want to find more examples of that. I, I want to believe that you can do well by doing good. And if we have a better North Star of these newer models, it will lead to better outcomes, right? And so maybe we can prove that. Maybe we can define new, you know, uh, key performance indicators, KPIs. We can find new definitions of growth and, and value and wellness beyond just units produced and sold, profitability, shareholder equity value, you know, that kind of thing, right? So that's sort of what I feel my mission is these days is to use these platforms, use these systems, but try to transmute them, find maybe better, more intentional ways to do them. Um, Mayfield, we came up with our North Star logo here, which was people first. And what that originally meant was focus on the entrepreneurs, you know, building the companies. They are the people. They are the first and foremost focus, even more than the tech, even more than, uh, you know, the specifics of the product or service or, or other things there. What I'm realizing, there's another meaning to people first, which is does this serve the people first and foremost? Is it good for people? Not necessarily even profitability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, is this good for people first? Yes, yes. Ooh, okay, that in, that in many ways uh, leads to this point, which is if we look at a the way that you were just describing um, the process of how we've grown the last couple of decades, in places like the U.S., we've had this phenomenon where median male income flatlines while GDP skyrockets and then we see that 50% of all new wealth is going to the top 1% and we're very curious as to what has happened in our social fabric that is creating that phenomenon whereas 
in a phenomenon like nature, we see these beautiful trees behind us, and we know that the trees that sequester more carbon distribute them through their root networks and fungal networks to seedlings and to smaller trees that don't so much. So that mechanism is missing from our wealth creation, but also our idea of moral, ethical, philosophical, spiritual evolution being missing as well in yeah. the sense of uh, the people first mentality of it Mayfield, that being missing where it's just, I just want to be selling something so that I can self deal. When we look somewhere like the Bay Area here where we're at, it's almost as though we don't even think twice about when we have such wealth, we do things like purchase a tenth property because of a diversified portfolio that wants to include real estate but as we sort of look down top down at this board game of monopoly and we buy these properties all of a sudden those thousands of people that are on craigslist looking for one thousand dollar a month bedrooms inside of the houses and those people are usually artists or entrepreneurs or other people that are trying to express themselves they can't fit into the bay area anymore so there's a there's a deep level of uh and we're now we're talking about inequality on just like the u.s side we're not even talking about 50 percent of people that still make less than three dollars a day which is the cost of a cup of coffee out here so there's levels to this and yeah. there's there's yeah. po there's potential speciation that's already happening with people that are able to you know take airplanes and travel and people that are still trying to find their next source of food or water and so where does that where where does that melting pot uh how do how, what, what are our redesigns inclusive stakeholding is a very interesting I love one that you brought that up yeah, yeah. I, was, I was gonna go there because yeah. uh, uh jun yun has always talked about a lot about inclusive stakeholding and i'm really doing my best to learn about how do we implement that right um something i'd love to help redefine is who is on the capitalization table, who are equity holders to begin with. Right now, we have a model where stakeholders are basically just investors and, and employees, right? But if we really want an inclusive stakeholding, every company touches more than just customers, investors, and employees. It touches Mother Nature, it touches you know future generations, it touches all these other stakeholders are not represented at the table. Could we update who is at the table and what stakeholding is to include that? If I had my way, we would have Mother Nature represented, you know, as part of the equity cap table. Um, Paul Stamets has done that. I think he's got uh, companies where he's assigned part of the cap table to nature itself. And maybe uh, nature is represented by, you know, a leading uh, nonprofit or, or, some, or, or a group like that that is a domain expert that could be a good steward and voice of that, uh, of that stakeholder, you know. Um, I also wonder too, could this lead to models where corporations there are compensating these nonprofit representatives mm -hmm. of stakeholders like nature, and that's a new revenue stream for them. So many nonprofits are not just in the death trap of having to raise money from donors all the time, right? Could it be symbiotic that way? Another set of stakeholders would be future generations, right? Would uh, future generations be able to be represented um, at the table as well. You know, I'm really interested if the Greta Thunberg, so the world could have voice to, to kind of say, hey, corporation, don't use up all the resources right now so that like, nothing exists for us to have a world in 50 years, you know, that sort of thing. So that notion of more inclusivity and expanded, you know, kind of stakeholding there, I think that could be really interesting because, uh, you know, these corporations and companies, startups, we don't exist in just a vacuum of our investors and, and employees. There's all the other elements we touch and they should have a voice at that table. Historically, many empires have been built and centralized on the backs of slave class labor, right? And what, uh, I was talking to Tom Chi about this and he kind of pointed out to me, you know, last century we began with essentially tech augmented strip mining at scale of natural resources. This century's tale that we started with so far is strip mining at mass tech-enabled scale of cognitive resources. And these cognitive resources, the mass population, is the new slave labor class building up the AI capabilities, the proprietary data pools of these mega platforms like Facebook, Google, and whatnot. We get these sort of free addictive services in exchange for our um, giving up the sovereignty and ownership and the <laughs> rights of our, our data and behavior. Right? And that's probably not a fair trade, really, in the long run. And um, 
many of us don't even realize the cost of that trade right now. Um, so I do think at some point we're going to need a cognitive and data bill of rights for these sorts of things. And that is something I've been working on with um, Adam Ghazali, Jack Cornfield, some others on this uh, Mobius uh, Open Compassion Project, uh, kind of dreaming of what would a what would a pledge of ethical values, ethical design principles for tech companies look like? What, how might it read? Thou shalt not intentionally addict your users. Thou shalt make users sovereign over your own data. You know, things like that, right? Because I think that's what it's time for Silicon Valley to step up to do, you know? This is much of what Tristan Harris has been ringing the, 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 the alarm bells on. So the <clears throat> The designing of the social fabric for inclusive stakeholding, for unleashing the inner artist in every single one of us to the uh, symphonic potential that could um, unfold is, uh, seems to be what not only, yes, yeah, Silicon Valley, but also that uh, Hollywood or that uh, the relationship between the US and China or that mm -hmm. If you take like a biometric consciousness signature of someone like um, mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos and try and like see that compared to like the Dalai Lama and just see, um, you know, really what is, uh, what is going on? Um, do people really care um, about the environment being a stakeholder at the table of their company? Like what would it look like to have that example where um, Mother Nature may be represented through one of the um, uh, 12 indigenous tribes that um, went to the United Nations to try and speak about, mm -hmm. about this. Maybe, th maybe one of them is literally on the board at, at uh, Amazon, yeah. right? So do they, do they how would that work out? You know, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah, A couple of thoughts like there. Um, I still believe that for-profit markets and, and companies are the best way to drive change <clears throat> if leadership at the top and the employees have that intention, that mindset. They can pattern, model these new behaviors, which I hope then creates positive peer pressure for other companies to want to do that. Eventually, I do think we need to upgrade how Wall Street um, investors, entrepreneurs even measure what success is and we'll need basically new metrics of economics anyway. Um, I have a couple of thoughts later, later to share. But the first one is that I think um, I'm really interested to see would we have more conscious and awakening of, of leaders, captains of industry, because they could drive change top down, you know, as they become more in tune, I think, with um, their, their own connection with nature, with others, with, and, and the role of responsibility as a leader. The second is employee activism. Um, I thought it was brilliant seeing uh, so many employees at Amazon sign petitions to say, hey, we need to participate in this. I think that probably drove a big part of why Bezos did sign that pledge for you know, sort of being more carbon neutral as a company. Um, I'd love to see more employee activism at scale, you know, decentralized and, and automated to basically raise a megaphone in mass to their leaders say, hey, we want to see more corporate action, more intentionality here from the top. And uh, I'm really curious, have you heard of the three and a half percent effect? There is a well-known uh, set of TED Talks uh, from a couple different speakers that, that showed that to get successful, non-violent um, sort of revolution and, and activism and change, that you only need three and a half percent of a population to do something like a coordinated climate strike or, or protest or whatever it is to cause change. Um, New Zealand recently, I think, was one of the first countries to hit that three and a half percent with a uh, climate strike where people, students would stay home from school, workers would stay home from work. And apparently that three and a half percent is all, need, all you need to really start to bring an economy to its knees and that's when you can really drive some change there. So I'm really keen to see mm -hmm. would more employees start to form this kind of, you know, kind of in mass decentralized activism hopefully without, you know, kind of threat of, of being fired or being retaliated against, right? Uh, but could that drive more change in, in corporate leaders to step up? I'm also very encouraged. Uh, one of my companies, Grove Collaborative, the CEO has said, we're going to be a B Corp from the start to the end as much as possible. And um, they're one of our breakout hit companies. If they can succeed with that, even go public as a B Corp, you know, they'll be one of the largest examples of a startup that scaled to that size as a B Corp. And I hope 
that would set a good example for others. So we need to model these new behaviors for others, create that positive peer pressure, drive that top-down change, as well as sort of, you know, kind of harnessing and empowering employees from bottoms-up activism as well. So I really do want to see that because companies can be forces for good, you know, especially if they're mission-based and have that pledge from the start to have this do well by doing, doing good, then start to bake in these things like inclusive stakeholding, you know, broader sets of, of um, growth metrics and value metrics beyond just profit or, or, or shareholder value. Yes. Right? So I think that's the era that's going to come next. To your point, though, how we change behaviors otherwise in, in the masses, this is going to be a bit of a downer, but I've come to the conclusion that in many ways it's too late. We, we are too late to prevent climate change. In fact, if anything, I've, I think I'm now a collapsionist, meaning there are many aspects of climate collapse which are already going to come, which are already inevitable. We're going to start to see more of these wildfires and extreme hurricanes and whatnot, and we're going to see more and more places be uninhabitable. And it's going to lead to patterns of change and where fresh water is available and where what types of food can be grown. Huge shifts of value, wealth transfer in terms of real estate development, you know, kind of um, the services and investment. Um, some studies show we have a 10, 11 years to start uh, you know, making those bets now. And uh, I've talked to Bruce Damer about this. He's working on climate moonshots. But picture in these next 10 years, people placing their bets on what the world will look like post climate collapse. And those folks who have prepared for it with the right kinds of infrastructure or investment and reallocation of population and infrastructure will lead to a post climate collapse bifurcation of you know, haves and have nots and picture the mass national migrations and refugee movements of those places that did not prepare for that. You know, entire evacuations of cities and maybe even countries, they fled to other areas. And you could imagine the ensuing war of those that were the haves that invested in that infrastructure now defending themselves against the have-not hordes coming in. So this could be a really bleak dystopian future. And I hate to say it, but I think parts of those elements will kick in. And um, when I really zoom out, there's also a part of me that kind of says, from a detachment standpoint, eh, maybe that's the way it's supposed to play out. Human beings were sort of herd animals by nature. Maybe we need the shit to really, really hit the fan before we do something about it. And maybe we'll, we'll need to see climate collapse really kick in before action takes place. That's been the history of humanity. We typically go through periods of like mass, mass, you know, kind of like collapse before periods of prosperity. Maybe that's what needs to happen. If you really zoom out and take that Kevin Kelly, you know, tech neum kind of future too, who's to say our job as a species maybe is just to reach the next rung of the evolutionary ladder? It's maybe homo digitas or homo silica or whatever we want to call it. Maybe we're like horses. Maybe we're at peak humanity. You know, what was it? Peak horse was 23 million or something like that, and now there's only a few million horses around. Maybe with climate collapsing and those effects, who's to say two, three billion people is, is better for planet Earth than, uh, than eight, nine billion, right? So it, it does lead to some big questions, and part of me kind of thinks that Nature is a pretty resilient system. You know, Mother Nature will self-balance with or without us. I hope that it's with us and that we're intentionally on that boat trying, trying to get there. But, um, you know, it, it'll, all be, it'll all work out the way it's supposed to in the end. A lot of our discussions we've been talking about, how do we design for humanity thriving? If we take a Mother Nature view, one of the best ways for Mother Nature to thrive is maybe less humans. <laughs> It's a pressure cooker in many ways. It's a perfect pressure cooker, and there's so many different ways of, of uh, viewing the pressure cooking evolution of consciousness that's happening um, where you have the, the good and the evil that are just constantly sort of at, at play uh, as it levels up where you did paint out this uh, very... Uh, D d d at times dystopian side, yet there's also this other side of, of piecing together the right um, um, w uh, evolved ways of, of our uh, uh, way that we engage with each other in our environment where it can actually be around um, making flourishing um, for, for unleashing the inner artist in all of us. So those two things kind of like... Um, it kind of it does kind of take me to this idea that 
yeah, it's it is it is perfect. It's been perfect. It's going to continue being perfect. Um, but it also kind of takes me to this idea of being um, off of perfect as well, meaning, um, uh, yeah, it can be seen as perfect to have um, this grand challenge of controversy where we have so many people that have so little and we have so many people that have so much and then that makes it perfect. But then there's also this other view of perfect, which is where people um, do have their b basic needs being met and the symphonies being played out where peop some people aren't going home uh, to uh, sleep on piles of cash and other people are going home to sleep on concrete. I agree. And um, what uh, I fear is that the systems, the business models, the, 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 the way we've set up the game today leads to centralization of wealth, especially when you look at exponential effects of real-time feedback loops, AI optimization, proprietary data sources, and these sort of mega platforms. What I fear is that the inescapable conclusion is the mass majority of wealth will end up in the hands of like a dozen people because with network effect type of businesses and platforms, that's what you get to, ultra centralization. Well, historically though too, when there's too much- Same it, thing happens when you play the board game Monopoly. That's right, that's right. And, and the thing is though, historically though, when there's that much inequality gap, eventually some mass revolution occurs and you know, you get wars and all that sort of thing. And so um, that'd be the equivalent of like, you know, people playing Monopoly over and over until like the players who keep losing, like screw this game, this is stupid. And they flip the table up and the pieces go flying, right? You know, so it could be very similar there as well. Um, I think this, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these tensions will continue to rise. We're seeing that America is now not one country. We've got this, you know, bifurcated tribalism happening. Um, and, uh, whew, you know, it's going to, like you said, pressure cooker. That's going to keep going. But many of us will kind of keep chugging along and trying to build unicorns here in Silicon Valley. But what I'm encouraged by, there's more and more of us, I think, waking up to these issues of inequality and wanting to examine at the root fundamentals. Maybe these playbooks aren't the right ones. Maybe we should up-level those. And those are the discussions I'm most interested in. I don't have the answers, and I don't want to seem like I'm on a soapbox preaching, and uh, I, I, I'm just trying to do my research on what are the alternative models out there. Where can um, service truly that people first, helping people be baked into the mission of businesses, where can nonprofit or hybrid business model uh, kind of uh, dynamics merge with for-profit? Could for-profits do more on this B Corp form, uh, formation of principles? Could they do more tithing or, or giving back? Yeah. And can nonprofits incorporate more best practices of for-profits and how they perform and their models so they're sustainable without just begging for donations all the time? Are there ways to do this yes and? Keep, yes. keep you know, kind of upgrading the, the, the firmware. Keep exploring new hybrid, new models. Yeah. Yeah, be on the side of the good and be on the side of c constantly trying to level up the good for all these different variables in the equation. Yeah, uh, and, and, and yeah. you know how we started the podcast was basically refine the questions, keep questioning the system, yes. and try to explore and build new models for the future. So that even includes question how capitalism is implemented today, question how stakeholding is done today, question how Silicon Valley works today. And it's it's changing. I think it is shifting and it's finding a new flow beautifully. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really good cover of, of um, most of what we wanted to discuss on the program. Um, constantly being in this wow, a moment to moment wow. Um, of the reality that we get to um, immerse ourselves in and be here sharing, and um, when we when we live in our ego or our identity, mm -hmm. we we don't get to maybe experience that wow as often as when we uh, don't. And so, to be uh, practitioners of the the drop rejoining the ocean on a moment to moment basis can help us with uh, being in a state of wow. Yeah, my, uh, this gonna sound morbid, my favorite keyhole into that has actually been death and dying. Uh, so something I'm interested in is how do we reframe the perception, the culture, the context around dying. Death is such a taboo topic in society. It's something nobody wants to talk about. And that's why it catches so many families off guard when, when it kicks in, right? Um, 
I, this last weekend, I, I did a training uh, to be a death doula, which is someone who helps hold space for the passing uh, of somebody. It's like um, a birth doula, actually, but uh, for the passing, the exiting of a soul as opposed to the bringing in of one. And the practices, um, the intentions, the, the rituals in that death doula process, I think really could inform us of how to found, find that wow in each moment. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful area. I encourage people to, to look into it. And um, it, it was something that was remarkable to me because in a lot of these things like meditation or when, when there are people doing psychedelic peak experiences, you know, everyone talks about ego death. For me, I've always thought these are actually opportunities to rehearse your eventual physical death. Mm. And in that moment, your mind will be panicking, that loss of like identity, your body will be screaming and fighting to just stay alive another moment because that's what it's programmed to do. And it could be sheer terror or it could be this graceful acceptance of, ah, I'm graduating. And so I kind of think a lot about perhaps we weave this cognition of death more and more into our everyday and knowing how to die well perhaps gives clues of how to live well. That's a really good doorway to this wow. You know, the practices you, you help foster as a death doula is a lot about weaving meaning, finding a through line of your life, creating rituals and legacy projects and, and these sorts of things, which really I realize we should be doing this all the time, even while we're healthy and living. Those are how you spot the wow in every moment, you know? And, and so uh, it, 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 <laughs> there's so much good stuff if you just pay attention. Like, just like, you know, yes. the pattern on your shirt, yeah. the beauty of the rose yeah. petals, yeah. or like, you know, yeah. how deeply you can go down the rabbit hole of just focusing on one breath. You know, like, there is yes. there is so much um, to, to notice and, and, and be present with, you know. Sleep is a brief exercise in death. Mm, yeah. And I like how you talked about death and birth doulas. I think that's very yeah. interesting. And yeah. dying preferences is interesting. It's so taboo that I can't uh, tell an urban metropolis that I don't want to go into your hospitals upon p upon my time of, of passing. I want to go out to the beaches or to the forests and I want to be out there with some people and that's how I want to pass and I want to be buried there and yeah. like it's yeah. just like no you can't you must be, you must be in this ho hospital uh, uh, extensionary uh, system plus uh, cemetery afterward or it's just it's very uh, important to talk about dying preferences and um, yeah and also just um, it's gorgeous seeing when the child comes into the world and when the person is leaving the world yeah. and these states of in between that right. we're in now That's and right. to have our perspective mm -hmm. augmented. It's all about perspective. So if we can augment the lenses at which people see reality uh, with uh, yeah. a deeper drive towards the the nature of it, um, uh, the beauty. Right. Uh, yeah. I think so. You know, there's that saying like, oh, you can see glass is half empty and or half full. But there's another perspective is, holy shit, there's a glass and it could even be filled. <laughs> right. So uh, my favorite exercise to tap into this is. Well, just picture yourself on your deathbed and in your imagination in that moment that you could be granted a wish to just go back to relive one day of when you were thriving and healthy. And right now is that remembrance actually that, that wish granted while you're actually on your deathbed. It kind of can shift your focus mm -hmm. quite a bit too, right? It, it also, for me right now, it took me to wondering what day of my life has been my best day. And why is it that uh, we don't try and make it so that every day is is like that? Um, right. Yeah, rather than to, yeah, the journey itself rather than the trophy. I want to I want to ask: uh, mm. Could we may be a, a a biological bootloader for a digital super intelligence? Very possibly so. Who's to say Homo sapiens is supposed to be the ultimate rung on the evolutionary ladder? That's pretty egocentric, don't you think? That could be pretty myopic as well, right? Um, again, perhaps we are a bootloader to the next step of the evolutionary ladder. Would kind of seem to make sense. It's yes. the same uh, supposition that makes me kind of laugh. Is like, why would we assume reality is bound to three dimensions in time in one direction? Yeah, you know. Yeah, remember that that uh, that story, Flatland, right? Or Flat World, or whatever. Sort of like. 
to a one-dimensional being, you know, like a two-dimensional line seems, or a two-dimensional space will always just kind of look like that line, right? And then uh, yeah. to a three-dimensional being, things look like 3D objects. But I think back to simulation, I think we are a simulation of 4D beings trying to figure themselves out by modeling things in 3D. Because what do we do? We try to figure ourselves out by modeling ourselves in these 2D types of surfaces, right? Yeah. And then four-dimensional beings are themselves simulations of five-dimensional beings trying to figure themselves out. And on and on and on, up and down the ladder. It's that turtles all the way up and down. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and then how about what do you think is most beautiful? Wow. Um, this is going to be so trite, but it's love. It's love. The, the kind of love where you want everything for somebody and nothing from them. You know, the first time I tasted that really was being a, a parent, yeah. you know, the love a parent can have for a child. Or, man, those moments when, you know, you're really in love with a fellow human being and just for all their flaws and their quirks and everything and, and, and you love them not just in spite of that but even for that, right? And, uh, man, that's probably the, the core of, of beauty. And a lot of it really starts with self-love, you know? That's the doorway to capacity for infinite love for everybody. Um, what I kind of think of is what if God is that part of ourselves that has that capacity to have this perfect love for another being. We often experience it as parents that, that I would give my life for this, this other being. But what if God is that capacity within us to have that same intensity and depth of compassion, empathy, and love for all beings, for, for all nature, for everything else around us, you know? A, a vast, infinite sort of sea of, of, of all-encompassing love. Yes, yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks for coming on to the program. Yeah. Thanks for talking to no, us. I'm sure we could riff for another couple hours. There's so many yeah. cool rabbit holes to go down. But thank you for the work you're doing on this. I mean, these are wonderful questions, wonderful things to ponder, wonderful things to take with us as we uh, move through the world. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. <laughs> Across all of the different things that Tim was teaching us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, check out the links in the bio below. Um, his Mayfield profile, also Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Go follow him. Go check out those pages. Also, do have more conversations with people online, your friends, families, coworkers, about all these different subjects. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. You can find all of our links to our show below on PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency. Join us, join the movement. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon. Thank you. Peace.